Welcome back, everyone. I am so happy to be joined again today by Philip Van Dusen, my friend, mentor, and business colleague. Thanks for joining me again on the podcast, Philip. Thanks for having me, Kathy. It's great to be back. Yeah. So before I start our conversation, let me reintroduce you to listeners. So Philip Van Dusen is a creative entrepreneur and owner of Verhall Brand Design, a branding agency based in New Jersey. As a thought leader, Philip shares his expertise in marketing, design, and entrepreneurship on YouTube to his 200,000 subscribers in his Brand Muse newsletter on the Brand Design Masters podcast and in his Brand Design Masters Facebook community. In his career, Philip has led creative teams on both the client and agency sides, serving as VP of Design for PepsiCo and Old in Navy and Executive Creative Director at the iconic branding firm Landor Associates. So in episode number six, Philip joined me and we talked about navigating a career over time, what it's like to jump out of a traditional corporate gig and into entrepreneurship, um, and why, when, and how one should build a personal brand. So I'll note the episode in the show notes so listeners can go back and listen to that conversation too. But Philip is one of my favorite people to speak with, so it wasn't uh, unusual that we ended up running out of time, and I didn't get a chance to ask Philip everything I would have wanted, so I wanted to have him back. So thank you again, Philip, as always, for being in conversation with me. So I thought we could start, Philip, with talking about burnout, because it's such a hot topic at this stage in the pandemic, and... I know you you and I both have experienced burnout at different stages of our careers. And I know even now for myself, I've been a little surprised by this, but I've been still experiencing this languishing effect, you know, that Adam Grant wrote about um, in the New York Times. And I've been, you know, trying to help myself, you know, by creating some space and, and get myself kind of back to a sense of flourishing. And, and that's working for me. But I'm curious if you have some thoughts on what you might think about what's happening around burnout right now, especially around perhaps creative, you know, your creative community. Um, and if you have any tips for how to manage it or think about it. I think that um, creatives have, uh, they, they experience it more because they tend to be very sensitive people. And I, creatives, I think, also um, have a level of perfectionism in their craft which is takes a lot of energy and focus and i think covid as you know as a stressor on all of us going on as long as it has at various degrees around the world has put significant stress on people's emotional reserves in general i think also there's a level of uh a need to uh step up and increase your skill sets to address the needs of the and the, the requirements of the creative economy for creative people. Um, the commoditization of design as a as a deliverable has been significant over the last probably five years. And now people and companies can get design on on Fiverr or through Upwork that's incredibly inexpensive from developing people in developing countries. And so creatives are having a much harder time commanding the prices that they used to command for their work. And I think that on top of the pressures of the global economy and COVID have kind of created this perfect storm of 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 stress for creatives. And um there's also been, as you know, this real blurring or or uh, disappearing of the line between work and home because a lot of people are working from home, and so our this our commuting time to our jobs has kind of evaporated and kind of turned for the most part into more work time, and we're not given that buffer between work and home that we used to have to kind of readjust our mindsets. We're just kind of like we'll walk out the door and suddenly we're in home right out of work, and we don't have that chance to kind of recalibrate. And I think that also is is uh, has created a lot of you know emotional um, stressors for people because it's kind of a whiplash effect. You know, we don't really have that separation of work and life that we used to not that it was all that defined before because i mean email is encroaching on our lives 24 7 anyway 
Um, but I think that some of those things have had a have an, have an effect on it. Yeah, this is so interesting. And I could see like, yes, this is acute on many levels for creative people. And yet I can see some parallels for others in, in the economy as well. This sense of, I mean, if you are a highly sensitive person or those that are ambitious and they have, um, they really strive for excellence or perfection. Like you said, they might get into this trap as well. This sense of these emotional reserves. And you're absolutely right. Like all of us, our emotional reserves have been tapped. I talk about building work-life resilience. And I think if people aren't being thoughtful about the fact that we need to re replenish our stores of you know emotional, like you're saying, these emotional reserves, you know, we're going to get ground down over time. And I think that's one of the reasons we're seeing so much burnout. Um, and then you're talking about like just needing to up-level skills. And I think all of us are having to do that, not just creative people. It still may be more acute, but, you know, if we want to remain relevant, you know, there's this pressure to, you know, continually improve ourselves. I think the pressure on the money, I think, is something in that downward kind of pressure of some of these, you know, the commoditization of design um, and creative, I, I think, is real. Um and I don't want to minimize this. And I think what you talked about too, this whole line between work and, and uh, home blurring and not having, you know, it's not having that commute as an example. I know I've spoken with people during this time where they have felt uh, guilty if they even paused, you know, a little bit before they, you know, went out their office door and kind of took, took over from the other you know, parent in the household who might have been taking care of kids, for example, and they said, well, why do I get 10 minutes, say, or 15 minutes to kind of pause and transition when they've been dealing with that all day? Like they need to transition too. And so it's an interesting thing where we don't, you know, there's these pressures. So what, have you been, you know, or is there any advice that you'd have for people based on your own experience of kind of dealing with burnout or seeing what, you know, if you've been in conversation with others around what's working for them to kind of, I don't know, it's almost like you need to release valve a little bit of all this kind of pressure, perhaps, of what's going on right now. I think that people need to put a lot more focus on self-care maybe than they have in the past. That's how I'm doing it. Um, I have tried to increase my frequency of meditation and doing yoga and physical activity, which I find to be very centering and also creates a level of um, uh, ease in my life. Because I think that when you exert yourself physically, it's number one, it's really great for your brain. It makes you feel calm in general. Um, but when you're bouncing very quickly between work and home, sometimes you don't have that buffer zone where you're going, oh, I'm going to go to the gym or, oh, I'm going to take a walk or I, I will take 15 minutes and do some meditation or I'll take half an hour and do some yoga. Um, that is making sure that you're demarcating aspects of your life so you have time for leisure or exercise or emotional well-being centering between the work and the life and trying to say it's not just work and life it's going to be work it's going to be life it's going to be self-care <laughs> and we have to almost give that its due and schedule for it i'm a firm believer in the fact that if it doesn't get scheduled it doesn't get done so i have a tendency to try to schedule out literally every half hour of my day granted I blow through deadlines. I, the, you know, the, the calendar smears for through the day, but it's, I start off with intent and an idea of what I can get done or what I'm focusing on and it makes me prioritize my day. If I, I don't do that, I get stuck in a lot of busy work. I'm, I have a real problem with kind of like if you're active and you're doing things, you're working, which isn't necessarily the case. A lot of times you can be answering emails, you're bouncing around looking at inspiration or reading some article or getting inspired for content or something like that, but you're not really getting work done. And so I actually, I actually I'm looking at it right now, I'm going to mention it. I actually put a sign up on my wall right in front of behind my computer. So I look at it all day long. It says stop puttering and do the work. And because I can get sucked into like puttering and, and feeling like my hands are moving, my mouse is moving, I'm doing stuff on the screen, but is it really moving the significant projects or initiatives that I have in my business forward? And that little saying on the wall just stops me for a second and makes me think, am, is what I'm doing right now puttering or am I like working on a thing? And so 
that's where I think that the, um, the level of, you know, kind of muscle, the new kind of muscles we need to develop are, is that we have to recognize what it is that we're doing and being very intentional about what we're doing. So we have to intentionally be working and working, moving the ball forward. We have to take in, have intentional self-care where we're walking or exercising or playing with our dog or whatever that is. And then we have to intentionally focus on home life and the people that we love and you know our significant others. So we're giving that due attention to all of those areas in our life. Um, and I think that this blurring of our lives has been a disservice to every one of those things. You know, every aspect is encroaching on another and making it less than what it could be. And so if I had any advice to anybody, it would be that it would be trying to be more intentional and in scheduling what you're doing and being very focused in doing that thing that you're doing. And when you separate it, separate from it. I really love that. And it builds on some folks that I've been talking with as well, talked about really being present when you're in the thing that you are focusing on and you're, you know, you're being intentional about I'm in work now. So let me be present to this right now. I'm with my family now. Let me be present to this right now. So that intentionality and marrying it with presence, I think is really important. I wanted to come back to the puttering versus doing the work because I think that also requires some discernment in the sense of uh, transitions. So one of the things I know even I'm challenged by is this idea that uh, taking breaks in the middle of the day and these micro breaks that we likely need. And because we don't, you know, many of us are not in an office, uh, you know, I've still been, you know, working from home from quite some time now, but I've only been really cluing into this more, even as I've been time tracking more, which I find really helpful, uh, as opposed to burdensome or annoying. I, I find it to give me information. But what's interesting is this idea that, you know, Charlie Gilkey talks about, you know, the idea of doing kind of uh, core P, like core work kind of requiring, you know, 90 to 120 minutes, right? And that after that, you likely do need a break. And so, I often find myself, which I actually don't love that I do this, like, oh, I'm transitioning between one work to another piece of work. Let me go look at Instagram to just, you know, free my mind a little bit, take a break instead of like walking around the block, you know, in the office that used to be like, oh, let me go get a coffee from, you know, or a snack, or let me, you know, go get a coffee with somebody in the office. And so coming back to your point of, you know, if you're puttering versus doing the work, are there times when, hey, how do you discern when I'm puttering because I need a break versus like I'm puttering because I'm procrastinating and I really need to get focused and actually go do the work? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, I think you're right. And, you know, procrastinating is, is a, <laughs> it's a horrible affliction. I'll just put it that way. And it is very difficult sometimes to tell whether you are puttering because you are avoiding and procrastinating or um, you are being perfectionistic and that's starting because you have a question or not really sure how you can do it the right way or the best way. Um, I think having a, self, a sense of self-awareness about what it is that you as an individual do when you're procrastinating or what that looks like in general, because we all know, we all know after you know, being in the working life for a while, what we do when we're avoiding a decision or what we do when we're avoiding, you know, getting down to work, you know, do we make lists? Do we, you know, go and, 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 and check our calendar? Do we try to strive for inbox zero, you know, whatever it is that we're trying to do that looks like work, but isn't, is in a way avoiding work. I think that if we try to recognize what those things are for ourselves as individuals, and then be very intentional and pay very close attention to when we are doing those things or when we allow ourselves to do those things. That for me, as I, as I put this sign up on my wall, I started to pay much closer attention to. I am a list maker. I am a planner. So I have a tendency to make you know, mind maps. I have a tendency to have extensive to-do lists that I'm continually reprioritizing or reorganizing. Um, I have a tendency to do a lot of, you know, short, middle, long-term goal planning and goal setting. And that's where I kind of escape to when I'm 
puttering or procrastinating. I, I in, And you can say, okay, you're planning, you're doing work, you're really actually trying to create, I, I am in a distant way trying to create some focus in what I'm doing. But when certain times when I find myself doing that, I'm not intentionally planning. I'm really kind of puttering rather than just addressing the thing that I got to address. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that that's, um, that's how I handle it anyway. I think um, just being careful of the difference between what work work is and what busy work is and yeah. trying to discern that for yourself. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, great. Well, I also wanted to talk to you about this idea that you had shared with me that during the pandemic, you sensed that there was this crisis of confidence uh, brought about, you were saying, I think by social isolation we're experiencing. I'm curious if that is still present, do you feel? And if people are still kind of recovering from that. So can you say more about what you're seeing around confidence? Yeah, I think that I th- I think it is becoming even more pronounced a crisis of confidence now that we are isolated from each other. And one of the, as I said, you know, many more people are moving to independent work through COVID or through choice or becoming independent or starting their own freelance business agency. And what that we are used to working in a group environment in an agency in a corporation and we bump into people and we go to lunch with them and we meet them at coffee or getting a snack in the kitchen we can reach over and say hey would you look at this design on my screen is is this font working for me or is this color working there are you know hundreds and hundreds of micro interactions that we have during the day where we get feedback and support from people emotional support from people you know, critical feedback on what it is we're actually working on. And that has, for the most part, disappeared from people's lives. And that for creative people, as you, you were asking about how does this stuff affect creatives in particular, I think that this sort of thing in creative people has been incredibly uh, detrimental and emotionally upsetting to them. And uh, and I see this in my my Brand Design Masters Facebook group where creatives are coming together to network and get feedback and share resources is there's a lot more people asking for feedback on things or whether they do are doing something right or whether there's a new resource that they don't know about all these sorts of things that used to come to us much more naturally in our working environments that now aren't and so people are having to find new pathways of gathering this information or getting the support getting this feedback and without those things we are less confident. We're less confident making a decision about what we should do, how we should prioritize our day, how we should approach a project, what we should do in some sort of, you know, creative deliverable, um, how we should make financial decisions about our business, how many clients to take, how much to charge for a project, all these sorts of decisions that we make every single day, unless we have someone to give us feedback or bounce things off of, we struggle, we flounder, we procrastinate, you know, we, our anxiety level goes up. And so that's why I've just been beating this drum for the last year as I've started, I started a a mastermind group called the Brand Design Masters Guild, where I am bringing together creative professionals to mastermind with each other, set goals, hold each other accountable, share resources, give each other feedback and support. And the result of those mastermind groups, um, when I ask for feedback and testimonials after they, after they end, the result of those has been overwhelmingly confidence. People are getting confidence out of those sorts of interactions. When I started the mastermind group, I didn't even know that that was going to be a selling point. And because after having now done four of them, the response being overwhelmingly that confidence is a, re- a long-term result of having gone through this sort of experience. That to me is telling me that confidence is seriously missing in people's lives and they don't even know it. They don't even, they just feel the anxiety. They feel the the worry, but they don't really know w- w- what's missing. And until they start to build meaningful networks with each other, have meaningful conversations, share meaningful feedback, they don't realize this stuff that they've been desperately missing. 
they couldn't name it, you know? And, and I think that now that we've been able to kind of name it, it's becoming much more apparent what the solution is. I think this is such an important insight, Philip, especially at this time of the pandemic. And as we think about what's going to happen in terms of whether or not you're a solopreneur, somebody who's a freelancer, starting your own business, uh, a small business owner, or you're somebody that works within a company, if you start to have more work at home time and you don't have these interactions, what I'm taking away is from what you're sharing is like, certainly this is very important to creative people, like getting this feedback, helping to sharpen ideas. You know, one of one of my coaching clients, you know, is a creative person herself, also a social being. Like, just imagine, I think back to when I worked at Minted in there, or even think about Anthem where we worked, where, you know, you have creative people who are sitting around each other. You can write next, you know, write, just ask your seatmate, hey, what do you think about this? Hey, can I pass something by you real quick? And the fact that you have to schedule everything to kind of make something like that happen today, if you're working from home, it can be very challenging and cumbersome uh, for creative people in particular. And But I, I also am starting to think like for all of us who are going to, you know, who are working at home more, or who are a little bit more isolated, this idea of building community or like you're saying, building meaningful networks is really important. So if I'm imagining, even if I work within a company, this idea that Hey, you might love the flexibility of working from home, but you may not realize what you might miss and what might might be, um, you know, that you might not end up having certain support, and that you might have to proactively really think about building meaningful networks as you're describing. Yeah. Yeah, and you have to go out and seek it out, and in some cases, you have to literally invest money in, in making that happen. And I think that that is one of the things that people, um, we haven't had to do in the past. And so people under, are understanding that they need to, this is one of the things that I, I tell creatives is that you have to think about your business as a creative person, the same way that you are telling your clients to think about their businesses. When we're working with clients, we are trying to get them to invest in us as creatives and agencies to do work for them, strategy work, design work, whatever that is, marketing work, in order to make their business stronger. So they are spending a portion of their revenue in investing in the success of their business through an agency or through a creative agency. The funny thing is, is that as we are constantly trying to convince our clients to spend money to improve their businesses, we don't do it for ourselves. Very few creative people, unless they're taking a specific course, actually invest financially in their growth. And so that's a mindset shift that I think that a lot of us are going to have to adopt is that we have to treat ourselves. We have to, we have to practice what we preach. We have to invest 15 or 20% of our annual revenue financially back into our business, whether that's through a mastermind or a course or something, um, you know, a conference uh, where you are really um, creating some sort of a, a growth impetus or some sort of a spark that's going to take you to a new place or teach you something new. Mm. Um, one of the things that, you know, you were, when you were talking that I kept thinking about was that, that, that isolation versus growth paradigm, meaning when we are taken out of our employment situations or our group situations, studio situations, we are suddenly isolated and a whole lot of growth and learning happened in those situations that I don't think a lot of people even realized. Meaning, let's take an agency situation where you know we used to work. And as you walked around in the studio, you might walk by the person who's in the financial department who's doing planning for the next quarter, or you might walk by, you know, the managing director who's working with the account team and they're talking about, you know, how we're going to, you know, pitch a new, a new client. Or you might, you know, walk by the, the photography studio and see how they're setting up for, you know, some photo shoot. And you are learning and absorbing a broader range of skill sets, cross divisional skill sets just by proximity. And, you know, you may be drawn into those conversations periodically and you're in, in you're broadening your skill set by being in that environment. 
now that we're isolated, we're not getting that kind of incidental exposure to a broader range of skill sets. And so we have to go out and find it. We have to actively go out and find it and nurture it and study it and take courses and like bring it into our world because it's not going to come in there by accident. And that's, that's when I think as we, as people move from a corporate or job environment to independent work, that's something that they've really got to pay attention to is that this level of learning community feedback is not going to happen on its own. You have to create and seed an environment or take some sort of action and investment in making that come into your business. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm very much of an introvert, you know me, Kathy. So I, I'm an introvert. So when I went from being in big corporate, big agency to working on my own for the first year, I was great. I was like all happy in my little home office and I didn't have to talk to anybody apart from, you know, doing content and YouTube videos and working with clients, obviously. And, but then after about a year, I was like, oh my God, I got to get out of here. This is like starting to freak me out a little bit. Like I'm not having conversations with people during the day. I'm not like getting up from my desk and walking to the, the water cooler. And um, so I, I joined a mastermind group and it was transformative and building a meaningful network for me literally overnight. And so I had people to get feedback. I had people to share resources with me. And um But that was a huge paradigm shift, a huge pivot in how I went around about my business that I was not expecting to have to do. And until I was kind of faced with that, you know, kind of freak out of being in my home office and feeling terribly isolated, was I able to kind of figure out what I needed to do. I think this is such an important lesson, Philip, and I appreciate you um, punctuating it and making it so clear because I think I experienced this too, you know, it's just so you're not alone. We're both introverts and yet, you know, can function quite well and as, as in an extroverted environment too. But this idea of like, like I, I also too sought out community because after a year of working alone, uh, it, it became it, it what didn't feel good, right? I needed to go and I needed to go learn and I wanted to be in community with other people doing what I was doing. Uh, I also did get a co-working space for a time, you know, pre-COVID because I knew I needed to get out of the house and not just be working at home. Actually, I needed a change of environment and I've always been a learner, but to your point, you know, you do need to kind of take your own development. And it's different when it's your own business too. It's not just your personal development and skill development, but like, what do you need to learn to like grow your business as well? So all of that is really important. And I think this is what's so wonderful about what you've been building with Brand Design Masters, the guild, the community, all the content and resources that you provide to people is all there for learning your courses, I should mention as well, you know, for community, et cetera. So, you know, if you are a creative and you're listening to this or an entrepreneur, like I encourage you to check out uh, what Philip has, has to offer because it's there because of this, right? Your passion to both um, and your purpose around helping creative people, um, but also this need that you really saw, saw in the marketplace. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I developed, I did a video once on like, eight personal brand archetypes. So I took the idea of having an archetype and I created, I I took, I sourced some from some other folks who had done this, but I added on a few of my own. And one of them was the crash test on me. And that's kind of, and there's another one, which is the guinea pig. So kind of, I am the guinea pig in this transition from big corporate, big agency to digital entrepreneurship and building my own agency. And so I shared all that content because yes, I want to help creatives, you know, improve and grow and learn and be successful in their careers. But by the same token, I was sharing this massive kind of like um, inflection point in my career that I was experiencing and having to think my way through and learn my way through and practice my way through. And I just kind of feathered in all of that learning as I went along to share everything that I was learning um, and experiencing with my developing audience. And um, I think that that's really, it's added a level of authenticity and, and uh, credibility to what I teach because I'm, I'm literally practicing what I preach. (laughs) You know, I'm, I'm going through what everyone else is going through. Yeah. 
Yeah. Great. Well, I'd love to close with just some rapid fire questions if I could. So yeah, we can't be um, done already. Jeez, oh, man, have we're to getting have a part close. Three. I know. I know. Well, we can always be in conversation. So, okay. um, so what does sustainable ambition mean to you? I, I am a lifelong learner. And I think that one of the things I, I, I've talked about previously is, and on some other podcasts I've been on is how when you're starting off, we, you know, you're in that, in that interview when you're leaving college and you're, and you're meeting with the, you know, the, um, the career counselor and they're saying, what's your passion? You know, you got to follow your passion or people say, you know, if you, if you get a job doing your passion, you'll never work a day in your life. And, and even later in our careers, thinking about what our passion is can be a very, very daunting and massively pressurized decision. <laughs> and so I encourage people to nurture, think about it more in terms of curiosity. Think about it in terms of where, what you're curious about, what you want to learn about, what is sparking your interest. Because if you follow those things and learn about those things, they will take you places that passion could never take you. Passion burns with a very bright fire, but it burns out. And But curiosity is something, is a little flame that you can kind of nurture and carry with you throughout your whole life. And so I think in terms of sustainable ambition, for me anyway, nurturing that level of curiosity and that, you know, what is the next step? What is the next step in my career I want to take? What is the, you know, is that managing people? Is that taking on a new division? Is that getting better at business development? Is that getting better at financial management, project management? Is it, you know, learning brand strategy and getting more involved with the strategy group? Um, whatever that next step is in your career that you want to learn about, that you're curious about, that you might think will make you more of a, a V-shaped skill set person than a T-shaped skill set person. Um, that that is what drives that's what drives me forward and has always sustained me through my career um but that's how i would encourage people to think about it that's great how do you define success for yourself um for me i mean the the funny thing is is that when i started off i started off as a fine artist and i started off as a starving fine artist i was not making a lot of money and i was in debt and when I started my first t-shirt company, I was $2,000 in debt. And so the most important thing for me to be successful was to like get out of debt and be able to pay my rent without worrying. So, I mean, I think, and people like to say, it's not about the money. You know, it's never about the money. You have to feel fulfilled. Yes, it is about the money. Let's be real. You have to like make a certain amount of money to achieve a certain level of comfort where you don't, I'm not saying you don't ever have to worry about it. Like, Jeff Bezos or, you know, Richard Branson, but you have to establish and focus on a certain level of financial, you know, kind of comfort to be able to broaden your viewpoint to what is, um, what you're more kind of interested in or what you're more passionate about. How I define success for myself now is very different than when I was younger. When I was younger, it was paying my rent and getting out of debt. And as I got older, as I became curious or had a new challenge or moved to a new sort of corporation or a new agency, it was, it was title and it was the company I worked for and the number of people I managed. So that was a level of kind of responsibility that if I performed to, it made me m more satisfied and more a uh, higher level of self-worth. Um, but then later on in my career, after I won a lot of the cash and prizes and, and had a lot of the business cards with big titles on it, I started to realize that someday that, that business card goes away and you can't invest your level of self-worth in a title or the name of a company that you work for. You really have to develop some sort of a ecosystem of, of, of presence that you own exclusively yourself. You have to build a personal brand on your own land rather than on the land of a company or an agency that you work for. Because eventually through economic downturn or a choice or life 
circumstance, you may end up getting laid off or you may choose to leave or something may happen and you can't really put all that weight in a, in your, in your title or your, for your salary for that matter. And so my satisfaction in the last six years has moved from being successful working for the man to building my own, uh, you know, environment brand ecosystem on my own that I own that no one can take away from me. And that, and I've done that through teaching others. I've done that through developing my own client roster, building an agency, um, working with more deeply with network partners on projects independently. So owning more of my destiny Mm -hmm. later in my life has come to be at the moment, my definition of success for myself Mm -hmm. is that I now own, I own my own brand. I own my own destiny. Mm -hmm. And, um, but that's not always totally easy or the right thing to do very early in your career. So I think to a certain extent, you know, your six, your definition of success will evolve and grow and change over time as you go through chapters in your life. It has for me. Mm-hmm. I really appreciate that. And you spoke in that you answered one of my other questions, which is like, how do you think about your drive or and your ambition over time too? And you kind of address that in that. Um, I'm running out of time with you again, Philip. I want to just say, ask one quick thing. Like, what's one thing you can't live without? One thing I cannot live without is music. I mm. love music. And I was in bands all through college and have played guitar and recorded music and written music my whole life. And very early in my career, I decided that it was going. To, I was going to relegate it to a hobby. I was never going to be on MTV or be the rock star that I, my hair thought I wanted to be. And um, so I've always kept it as a creative outlet that no one can touch. No one can give me feedback on. No one can tell me what to change. And I've, and I've always kept music as kind of a sacred um, inspirational place and a creative space that I can do my own thing in. And so um, playing guitar now in the last couple of years, I was taking up piano and learning how to read music for the first time in my life. Um, that to me is something that I definitely could not live without. Mm, I love that. And so smart to keep something for oneself. Um, I'm going to try to squeeze this in, Philip. Like, what would you want for people? Just a final piece of advice. What would you want for people as they look to build sustainable and, and ambitious careers? One of the things I, you know, I was thinking about in a podcast interview I was doing with someone else recently was about saying yes, saying yes to opportunity. Um, because a lot of times we may be in a situation where we're given an opportunity to do something, but we may feel overwhelmed by it. We may bristle at it thinking this is above my pay grade. You know, this is above my title. You know, I'm being, something's being foisted on me. And, uh, or you may get hit with some sort of unforeseen jog or pivot point in your career that you're not expecting. And so, my advice is to kind of just say yes, because if you're in an employment situation where you're being asked to do something, to be look, able to look at it as an opportunity, as an opportunity to work, do the next pay grade job before you get there, before you're given the title, to see number one, if you like it, and see number two, if you're good at it, and see number three, if it might actually get you moved up to that spot. Um, and to the same, and, to, and by the same token, saying yes to any kind of opportunity or side jog in the web of your career that you may not have planned for or and may not have been immediately apparent, but to be open to it because those are the sorts of um, kind of chance um, events in our lives that can lead us to new, to new verticals, to new, to new heights. I love that. Thank you. And I know people can find you at philipvandusen.com, which I will capture in the show notes with all of your other links to the brand design masters and all of that. What else should people know about what you're like offering right now that we can support you around? I'm so glad you asked. Um, at the end of uh, the beginning of September, I'm relaunching my signature course, Brand Strategy 101, where I teach uh, creative professionals the basics of brand strategy so they can expand their skill sets and understanding of business. And uh, so I am now 
currently taking people for the waiting list for the relaunch of Brand Strategy 101. So if you go to philipvandusen.com slash BS101, that will take you to a, a page which will describe the Brand Strategy course and give you an opportunity to sign up for a waiting list for that to come out. That's awesome. I will definitely capture that in the show notes and promote it and encourage people to really think about um, taking this course. I, I know some of the content in the course um, and you know, have had the opportunity to work with Philip and partner with him on brand strategy projects over the course of my career, which I'm so grateful to have had him as a creative partner in this work. And um, I think it's such a smart thing to really, if you're, especially if you're more expertise is in design, to really think about expanding your capabilities in this space um, and giving you some additional tools in your toolbox, if you will. So, well, and I have to give you your props, Kathy, because it was with our work together at an agency we used to work at in San Francisco that Kathy was one of the main catalysts in my learning brand strategy when I was in that point in my career. And you are so smart and so <laughs> so amazing when it comes to being a strategist. And I've learned so much from you that um, a lot of what you have shown and taught me is in this course. So people oh. are benefiting from your expertise in this course as well. Well, thank you, Philip. It's been always been a partnership. So um, I appreciate it. Thank you again for being on with me today. I really appreciate it as always and look forward to the next conversation. Thanks a lot for having me on, Kathy. Find more inspiring interviews and get show notes for this episode at sustainableambition.com slash podcast. Make sure you don't miss an episode or my insider tips, guides, and tools by signing up for Sustainable Ambition Forum, my twice monthly newsletter. Sign up at sustainableambition.com slash subscribe. Thanks again for joining me. Speak with you next time.